All right, so last time we talked about plane elasticity formulations, and at the end we uh, derived an element stiffness, did an example of an element stiffness matrix for a triangle, right? Uh, there are some gotchas in plane elasticity, and so let's, let's look, take a look. <clears throat> let's look at a little segment of a beam. Right, and when I say beam, I mean like an Euler beam. Right? So if you go back to your undergraduate solids class, right? So if I apply a moment to each side of this beam such that I deform it, something like that, and the angle, kind of lost my, let me erase this, All right, just for node purposes, I'll rewrite it over here. All right, so the angle here is theta. And this distance is 2a. Well, if you just go back and look at your undergraduate mechanics, solid mechanics textbook, you'll see that the strains in this beam are minus theta y 2a. Again, so the assumptions are Euler beam, right? So the assumption of Euler beam is that it's long and slender, right? And that planes remain planes in the beam. Uh, planes, planes originally parallel remain parallel, right? And of course, we're assuming isotropy too. So under those assumptions, these are the strains in the beam. This is not has nothing to do with the discretization. This is straight undergraduate beam theory, okay? Continuum beam theory. All right. So let's take now a finite element, a Q4 finite element. So when I, when I say Q4, I mean a quadrilateral with four nodes. I guess I used Y there and I never defined it, but this is Y, X. All right, so if I apply a moment to this Q4 in the same way, well, you know, when I apply the, the moment, it's the same, you know, I can replace it with a, a system of force couples, right? So it is going to have forces like this, right? And there's only linear interpolation between these two nodes. So the only type of deformation that this type of element can undergo when, when being subject to these moments is to deform like this. Right, where now this is the angle. This is still 2a. And now the strains for this guy are this. All right, so that looks good. Uh, don't really like that. All 
And this I don't like at all. So what you see here, if you compare the strains to the continuum strains, that this type of element produces a parasitic shear. You know, it's a, it's a spurious shear, shear strain. Okay? And it's an artifact of the element formulation, right? This is the shortcoming of the element. We can't, the only time, we only have linear interpolation between these nodes and between those nodes. So if I apply a moment and I have a force couple there, the only thing I can do is make it look like this. And then these are the strains I get from that. Yeah. No, no, the, st the strains there are, are computed from, you know, the displacements. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Right. From the, the strain displacement matrix, basically. From the shape functions, right? So, the, you know, the, the strains in a, strains in the final element come from the, the B matrix, right? right? The strain displacement matrix. Which is like the derivative of the shape functions. All right, so consider, uh, let's look at the elastic strain energy. So the elastic strain energy We're talking about 2D here, so talking about just a planar case. So the strains are just like that. So in a beam, the work done by a moment should be equal to the strain energy. So in a continuum, we'd have this. In our element, we'd have this. And so if we apply the same moment under plane stress, so here we're using the, the assumption that C has the coefficient values that according or corresponding to the plane stress condition, then we can show that the ratio of the angle for the element to the true angle, or the continuum angle, is this. And the term A over B squared is present because of parasitic shear, shear. So if we take the limit as the ratio of A over B goes to infinity, that goes to zero, therefore this equals zero as A over B goes to infinity. All right, so what does that imply? So the theta, 
theta is the is the angled measure, the measure, right? Uh, th theta e is for the element case, and theta is from the continuum case derived from, from beam theory, right? And if that ratio is zero, what does that mean? It means that there's no deformation, right? Right, because the only way that could be zero is if theta, you know, means there's no deformation. So in other words, the mesh locks. So what is, think about what is A over B, right? A and B are the width and height of the element. So if B is, if that ratio, if the element becomes very long and slender, right, if that ratio is very bad, then, or as it gets worse, then the element, the mesh will lock. So it won't deform. Okay, and it's a purely a numerical artifact or an artifact of the discretization. So it's something to be aware of. And that's why we really strive in fine element formulations to have really good shaped elements. All right. One of the reasons is in, in planar is due to this locking. And uh, another reason has to do with, has anyone watched the video I put up that's assigned for Thursday yet? OK. Yeah, so in that, we're talking about parametric, isoparametric elements and mapping. And there's a, this thing in there called a Jacobian. And, and that Jacobian also drives the shape of the element. Right? You have to be able to invert this Jacobian matrix. And if the element is con not, not convex or poorly shaped, then you can't invert that thing. Right? So the point here is there's multiple reasons to have a good quality mesh meaning the elements are as regular as you can get by with. And I've got an example in just a second, but let's talk about another artifact. <clears throat> 